DOE CSGF Fellow Ian Oakes in the field of plasma physics at Princeton University. Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in. My name is Ian Oakes, I'm a graduate student at Princeton University, and today I'll be talking about my research on transport and magneto-inertial fusion plasmas, specifically how transport effects can be leveraged in order to increase the fusion yield of these magneto-inertial fusion reactions. So the plan of my talk will be as follows. First, I'll discuss the difference between magnetic and inertial fusion and why these became the main sort of pathways to fusion um, in research in the United States. I will then talk about um, sort of combining these approaches in an approach known as magneto-inertial fusion and specifically talk about maglith and uh, the details of that approach to fusion energy. I will then talk about um, how ash, as the fusion reaction proceeds, um, tends to choke the fusion reaction and why it's important to extract that ash from the fusion core. I'll talk about how unmagnetized transport differs from magnetized transport, and specifically how magnetized transport is very qualitatively different and leads to entirely new effects that allow you to flush fusion ash from your reaction core. And finally, I will talk about more recent numerical developments specifically to the, the development of a code mittens that we've constructed in order to explore these ion-ion transport effects in more detail and to um, explore some of the heat and uh, momentum transport effects to go along with these uh, sort of particle transport effects. So the inertial approach to fusion energy is this approach where we say, okay, let's confine the plasma at very high density for a very short amount of time. Um, so you end up with this very fast compression of the plasma and you hope you hold it there at that high density just long enough to achieve break even. So at the NIF facility at um, Lawrence Livermore, this is achieved with lasers. You, the laser powers the compression. And the other main approach, the Z-pinch approach, um, you run an axial current. That axial current creates an azimuthal magnetic field which pinches the entire plasma inward to a very high density in a silicon. Now the other main approach is the magnetic fusion energy approach, which is the confinement for a long time of a plasma at a lower density. And the way this is usually achieved is by the use of magnetic fields, because a particle um, in the presence of a magnetic field, a charged particle will be stuck in a helical orbit around that magnetic field line. So if you wrap those magnetic field lines around on themselves into a sort of circle donut shape, um, then the particle will be stuck on a helical trajectory which wraps around upon itself, and thus you get a long-term confinement of a plasma. This idea has been around for a long time, since the 1950s. Um, here you can see Andrei Sakharov, a famous physicist and human rights pioneer, initial sketch where he proposed a tokamak you can see the particle stuck on its helical trajectory around the magnetic field line, and these field lines wrapped around on their ends to form a closed loop. So you might ask, why not do both? Why not have a magnetic field to inhibit the transport of uh, particles and heat out of the plasma, while also doing a fast reaction at very high density? And this is the idea behind what's termed magneto-inertial fusion. The main example of which is uh, maglith, magnetized linear inertial fusion. The basic idea is to take a Z-pinch, but to add an, a magnetic field along the axial or the vertical direction, um, so up and, up and down along the plasma column. And then as that plasma column compresses, you have the magnetic field prevent the transport of heat perpendicular to the magnetic field along the direction in which the plasma column is getting shortest. So you uh, prevent the transport of heat in the direction that really matters. And one of the really notable things about these reactions is that because you have this laser heating initially, you tend to have a very hot spot at the center indicated by this red region where most of the fusion is occurring. And then you have a denser, colder edge where less fusion is occurring. And that will turn out to be a main feature of the, that's important for the transport dynamics. Now, as this fusion reaction goes forward, 
um, the deuterium tritium reaction in particular will produce both a very high energy neutron and some high energy helium ash. And that neutron just leaves, it's not charged, so it's free to just ignore all the fields and leave. But the ash is a charged particle, and so it sticks around in the plasma as long as you have that magnetic field. Now, initially, this confinement is good because you want to harness that 3.5 MeV, MeV that the alpha particle is producing in order to drive further fusion. This is what's known as a burning plasma, where it sustains by the fusion is sustained by the energy it's producing from its own fusion reaction in the form of that those uh, really high energy helium atoms. However, once you've got that energy out, that ash is just choking the reaction. You're sort of putting in energy to heat that ash, but it's not giving you any fusion out because the helium um, doesn't give you fusion at the same temperature. And so you want to extract that cold ash out of the hot spot once it's, once it's thermalized. And this requires understanding the transport of, um, of this helium ash as in regions of changing temperature, so where there's uh, thermal gradients. Now, in unmagnetized transport, the basic picture of how an helium ion, the ash, diffuses is basically you have a helium ion, it whizzes around free for some amount of time, eventually it gets close to some other particle, it collides, um, it goes off in another direction, it collides, and this is a random walk process where the typical step size is the mean free path and the typical step rate is the collision frequency. And in this talk, we'll be considering mainly helium colliding with other ions, the fuel ions, um, because that's the dominant process that determines the collisional transport. So what happens to this process if you have a temperature gradient, and so far an unmagnetized plasma? Well, one thing to know about particles in plasma is that hot particles collide a lot less than cold particles. So if you have your little helium ion, It'll have hot particles coming in from the hot part of the plasma, the, the hot spot, the fusion core. And those aren't really um, interacting with it very much because hot particles collide less. However, the cold particles are hitting it from the cold region, and they're colliding way more. So the net force will be into the hot region, away from the cold region. And the net result is that your fusion ash is pushed into your hot spot, thus further choking the fusion reaction. So this is bad. Now, once we add the magnetic field, we have a very different picture of how diffusion and transport occurs. Because instead of um, streaming along um, straight line trajectories in the absence of collisions, uh, charged particles will now be undergoing helical trajectories around the magnetic field lines. So in this figure you see here, we have an out of plane magnetic field. And so the helical trajectories appear as circles in the plane. And so this helium ion will be executing um, a circle of a certain radius known as the gyro radius in that plane. And so it goes around, it goes around, and at some point it collides into a fuel ion, a deuterium or a tritium, and now it goes onto a new helical trajectory around a different gyro center indicated by this gray line. So now you have a diffusion process where the typical step size is the gyro radius instead of the mean free path. And the diffusion just looks very different than it does in the case of uh, unmagnetized transport. So you are on your gyro radius, you have a collision, and you're suddenly on a new trajectory. So there's two other important things to note about magnetized transport in order to understand our results. First, the direction of the net transport that you have depends on the direction of the applied force, but in a, in a non-trivial way. So uh, say I have this helium ion and it collides with this background fuel ion. So looking at this picture, you can see that the net force on the helium ion is in this sort of downward direction indicated by the screen arrow, downward and to the left. Um, but that, does, that isn't where the helium ion goes in terms of its magnetized transport. In fact, the gyro center moves in the direction given by the cross product of the force and the magnetic field. So you can do your sort of cross product with your hand and see that this, uh, this force goes in the F cross B direction. So 
So in order to understand where the ions are going, we'll want to cross whatever forces we get from our thermal analysis with the magnetic field. Second, magnetized transport is different in that it introduces this constraint known as ambipolarity. So basically, due to collisions between two ions, no net charge will move due to the collisions. Um, so my helium ash has a charge state of two. Um, you can just look at the periodic table. Whereas my um, fuel ions, deuterium and tritium, are isotopes of hydrogen, and so they have a charge state of one. So every time I have one helium ion move out of the hotspot, I get two fuel ions moving in to take its place due to this ion bipolarity constraint. So it's extra good to extract ash from the hotspot because you're actually driving fuel in if you manage to do this. So what does transport actually look like in the presence of these thermal gradients in a magnetized plasma now? Well, we still have hot particles colliding less and cold particles colliding more. So if we look at the forces on our helium ion, we see that these cold particles um, coming in from here uh, will be providing the direction of the net force on the plasma. So the net force is off to the right. You cross that in and you find that the <clears throat> you find that the helium ash is now directed down into the cold region of the plasma in contrast to the case of unmagnetized transport. So once we magnetize this plasma, which we're already doing in magneto-inertial fusion, we suddenly find that fuel is pushed, um, oh, sorry, the ash is pushed out of the hotspot and that the fuel is pushed back into the hotspot, um, which is the desirable feature we wanted. So in order to see the effect that this could have on a fusion reaction, we did a 1D diffusion simulation just with a simple model um, of a maglev reaction near the point of maximal compression when it's most magnetized. And because these compressions are subsonic, you can approximate the plasma as being isobaric, i.e. having constant pressure. So because of that, and because we have a hot spot in the middle, you're gonna have a dense cold edge out here, and your hot spot will be a little sparser, but it'll be the hot core where most of the fusion is occurring. <clears throat> so we did simple, simple 1D diffusion simulations, and here I'm showing the change, um, the change in the helium concentration and the fuel concentration due to the fact that we have this magnetized transport effect compared with the case of no diffusion. So you find that um, compared to a case of no diffusion, you have less ash in the core, uh, as you'd expect. So alpha particles are another name for helium. So this N alpha is the ash concentration. You find that you have more fuel in the core. And as a result, you have more total fusion energy in the core. And overall, we found that you would get about a 5% energy gain relative to the case of no diffusion, which relative to the case of unmagnetized diffusion, is uh, probably even more because that was actually a negative effect that was working against you, whereas we compared to the case of a neutral effect. Um, but those cases aren't, it, it's tricky to directly compare those two cases. So just going to the case of no diffusion made more sense. So now that we've seen that this simple model can yield uh, these very beneficial and interesting results, it's desirable to have a more full model of transforming the plasma. For instance, it would be good to, in, Involve both energy and heat transport rather than just taking the imposed temperature profiles and an isobaric assumption. The evolution of the electromagnetic fields and their associated effect on the transport coefficients, as well as uh, allowing for flows and uh, viscous dissipation and such in the plasma. Um, and this requires much more intensive simulation of the full set of transport equations. So to answer these questions, I and another graduate student at Princeton, Elijah Combs, developed, the, developed MITTENS, the Multiple Ion Transport Numerical Solver, which solves the transport equations for multiple magnetized ion species, solving for density, momentum, and heat transport all simultaneously. We implemented a finite volume second order method um, with good stability properties and with advanced time step being provided by CIVO uh, library developed by Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Um, and we just released the first version of the code. It should be, uh, it should be um, published soon. 
um, but you can find it for now on the archive. And with this code, we can explore sort of the rich thermal physics associated with all these effects. For instance, there's a new effect, um, the theory developed by some, another graduate student in our group, Mike Mlodek, uh, where he found that the ambipolarity condition that we talked about um, in magnetized transport is associated with closely with a heating term. So the fact that you, um, when you move one charge up, you have to move an equal amount of charge down, gives you interesting compression and heating effects that he's termed charge incompressibility heating. And we've been able to explore this with the new code. There's also rich Eddingshausen and Nernst physics, which relate the temperature gradients and the resulting frictions you get, and as well as a complex viscous damping and heating effects in these plasmas. And you can find some details of that thermal physics in another recent preprint. So now we're looking at extensions to this code to more realistically model the, the maglev uh, reactions. So for instance, um, we're looking at implementing a cylindrical rather than a slab geometry in the code, which should allow for things like uh, the spin up of vortices as you compress and the associated transport with that, the associated, um, the, the transport effects associated with the resulting centrifugal forces from this rotating plasma, all of which lead to very interesting um, transport phenomena. We're also looking at extending the code in the cases of partial magnetization, where, for instance, perhaps the fuel ions are magnetized, their Hall parameter is greater than one, but your really high Z impurities uh, that are coming in from your liner um, might not be magnetized. And what happens in that case in terms of where the thermal friction pushes those impurities? That's work we're very curious about and looking into now. Um, we're also looking at implementing a sort of compressing frame so that rather than having a coordinate system that's fixed in space, you have your coordinate system sort of evolve along with your plasma as you compress it, allowing you to maintain resolution as you compress. And finally, um, for a somewhat different application, we're looking at the inclusion of neutrals in this code. So linear plasma experiments um, have a very hard to predict rotation profile. And a lot of this is due to the effect of neutrals and the conductivity associated with those neutrals. So including this new, this, these neutrals in those codes um, should allow for us to better predict how linear plasma experiments will rotate, which is important for things like plasma mass filters, which might have application in the separation of nuclear waste. So in summary, we found that magnetized diffusion can draw impurities out of the hot spot as opposed to uh, unmagnetized diffusion, which pushed them into the hotspot. And that this beneficial effect gave you a fusion energy gain of about 5%, um, as suggested by the very simple model we implemented. And so now we've developed the mittens code to do, to explore the more, the full multi-ion transport dynamics. And we're excited to see uh, the directions that takes us. So as a final note, I would love to acknowledge the rest of my uh, Princeton team that I worked with, my advisor, uh, Nat Fish, as well as my fellow graduate students, Elijah Combs and Mike Mlodek, who helps with a lot of this work. And I'd also like to, of course, thank CSGF um, for the four years of support they've given, um, and particularly Lindsay Iles and Michelle King, who have been very wonderful in sort of interfacing and providing these opportunities. So thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the talk.